We good? We're looking at major learning in the minors, and so we've been looking at the minor profits, and the feedback from um, at least some that have offered feedback is that it's been beneficial. Even though these are overviews or summaries of these sections, they're still books that we don't spend often a lot of time in. We don't necessarily have a context to them. We kind of forget that they're an important and valuable part of Scripture that is applicable to us even today. And so today we're going to take a look at Amos, the book of Amos, page 1419 in the guest Bibles, and thirsting for a God of forgiveness. Now we've been through some of the minor prophets already, and it's a little difficult to pick what they were thirsting for, because a lot of them overlap and repeat each other. And Amos in particular... It is thirsting for a God of forgiveness, and if you've read through the nine chapters, you may wonder, well, why did he pick that? And it's more of he hopes that they would thirst for a God of forgiveness. Because it's almost like it's the thing that's missing in Amos. He's presenting a God that will forgive, but people aren't asking. They have such an assumption that everything is right and that God isn't going to bother anybody and how can there be a, you know, there's no judgment coming because life is fantastic. It's the highlight of the kingdom of the Israel's, uh, it's their heyday. They were financially fine. Their property was fine. There were no, no major threats. The Assyrians were also in one of the highest parts of their kingdom as well. But I want to say all that to get us going because of this point. The main point is that people are thirsty for God whether they acknowledge it or not. Is that something that you believe? Do you believe that what people really are seeking in their life is God? And that what they're missing in life is a relationship with God. And they may be trying a thousand other things or trying nothing or just giving up on the whole hope. But what they really do need is God. Amos, God places this passion in him to go out and talk to people and say, but you still need God. And judgment is coming, and you still need God. And people are thinking, what do we need a God of forgiveness for? We haven't done anything wrong. So I think out of the minor prophets that we've looked at so far, Amos is one of the most applicable to where we are at now in our day, in our age, in our culture, in our city of trying to present a God of forgiveness to people that are too distracted and too deceived to really care. When we read Scripture, we meet God and realize how He quenches our thirst. There's major learning in the minor prophets because they help us to see the aspects of God that we're thirsting for, that we have thirsted for, or that we will thirst for. Reading Obadiah helped us consider our thirst for a God of action, but helped us also realize that we need to let God decide when he acts. Joel helps us when we thirst for a God of salvation, or even a God of deliverance that will get us out of tough times. Reading Jonah helps us thirst for justice. We realize that when we want justice, we're actually crying out for a God of compassion and mercy. Reading Amos helps us thirst for a God of forgiveness and warn people to get right with God before judgment. God is very complex, and when we look to Him, He reveals Himself in ways that help us to know Him and to make Him known. Point, point. <clears throat> That's why we're here, because God is so complex. In each of these minor prophets, we get a part of the story, a glimpse back, a reflection of who He is. And when we put them together, the book of the 12, the 12 prophets, minor prophets, it starts to make a little more sense. So we've talked a little bit about the background. This is part of the material we just don't have time to cover deeply, but there's lots of information about each of these books. We're looking about 755 BC during the Assyrian rule. We're still in the United Kingdom of Israel, all 12 tribes under one leadership. That ends between David and Solomon. So that's the time frame that we're connected to. The audience, unique in this, in Amos, is that he preaches from the south right through to the north. 
He's a circuit preacher. He would go area to area to area, but he wasn't a preacher and he wasn't a prophet until God called him. His name, interesting name, probably not Burden, because that would be a tough name to give a kid. Hello, Burden, how are you? But more likely Burden Bearer, just because I think that's a part of naming children would be beneficial to give them something positive. One who carries a burden. Do you like that? a pretty good name. But it's not a name, it's often a shortened form. It's of other longer names. One who bears a burden of what? And then that part of the name would be attached onto it. He was a shepherd and a traveling fig nipper. It doesn't ever use the term fig nipper, but if you're going to remember Amos, you can remember fig nipper. So what's a fig nipper do? He nips figs. He travels and he prunes trees so that they're more fruitful. But it's a specialty because you have to be able to read the tree and to know what its growth is and how to do what you do. And so he was paid to travel from the south to the north as the trees matured and make sure that Israel's fig trees were productive. So how did he know what everybody in every town, what they were thinking and where they were at? because of years of being a fig nipper, a traveling fig nipper. God uses whatever background you've had to help you be effective. So hopefully you've been reading along, and if not, maybe this is a good connection. Maybe you're reading behind. Maybe we do the sermon, and then you're reading, and then... I don't know, but I hope that you're spending time to read these. And Amos is a little longer. We're looking at nine chapters in here. Chapter 1, verse 1 helps us with the date because it talks about the earthquake. And so we can get into that. The words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa, what he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake when Uzziah was king of Judah and Jeroboam, of Joash, son of Joash, was king of Israel. So that's what gives us a date. Even that's not specific enough and argued about what we're going with 755 because you got to just pick something. God knows what is going on and he will act, chapter 1. That reminds us also of Revelation chapter 2 and 3 where the seven churches, God knows what's going on and the judgment that is due. In chapter 1, God knows what each of these other nations or areas, the Philistines and the cities around them, what they have done to Israel. And he starts with, these are why these other people are in trouble. The main part of the chapter focuses on why the people around them should be concerned about God coming in judgment. This is the clapping section of Amos, because the audience would read that and say, yes, they deserve that. That's one chapter out of nine. Guess who gets it next? Chapter two. We start with Moab and the Moabites. We've had a connection to those with Obadiah. Moab is addressed and then things get close to home as Judah is addressed in two, four, and five. And Israel, that's the ten tribes of the north. They're addressed in two, six through eight. God's faithfulness and a reminder of God's provision are covered in chapter 2, 9 through 16. God has cared for you. Did I not deliver you from? Have I not protected you from? And a reminder, I've been with you this whole time. Why have you turned your back on me now? Chapter 3. The north and the south are addressed because he says, those who I delivered from Egypt... And it's pointed out that God has warned them. Amos chapter 3 and verse 7 says, Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. To say, this is not going to come to us as a surprise if you've been listening, if you've been trying to pay attention to what I've been saying. I've been saying this over and over. God does not act just on a whim. He doesn't just get frustrated and do something. He has warned you of what is coming. And he's used the prophets. Chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 1, is funny. You might not think there's a lot of humor in the Old Testament. I don't think that they would have taken it as humor. But when you get called a cow of Bashan, that's funny. 
It says, hear the word, you cows of Bashan on Mount Samaria, you women who oppress the poor and crush the needy, and say to your husbands, bring us some drinks. That's funny. Why is that funny? Because it's funny. He refers to them as the cows of Bashan, these, these glorious beasts that do nothing but get taken care of. And he gets after the women for living in opulence and saying to our husbands, bring us some drinks. I don't know. That's just one of those verses that just stands out as funny. But then he provides more reasons for their captivity, warnings of what is to come, why their acts of worship are meaningless. Is that kind of significant? It wasn't that they stopped being faithful to God. They were going to worship. They were attending services. They were bringing offerings. And how they did not turn to God during difficult times that were intended to help them turn to God. He said, I brought, I brought famine. I brought difficulty. But you didn't turn. I tried to warn you of what's to come. I tried to get your attention. But you didn't pay attention. In chapter 5, he says, only a remnant will be left. That's the bad news. What's the good news? A remnant will be left. God will, the majority of you are going to get punished and be destroyed, but a part of you will be saved. God, through the prophets, especially the minor prophets, talks a lot about God saving a remnant. There's some really good stuff in the major prophets, too, about cutting the hair and then dividing it into thirds. There's some really good imagery that fit with this concept. This chapter also speaks about having a heart that seeks after God. I don't want you to just do things out of ritual. In Amos 5.18... Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. That day will be darkness, not light. See, they were so arrogant that they were saying, oh, I can't wait till God comes in judgment. Because he's going to get rid of all of these evil people around us. Won't it be nice when God just takes care of all of these sinners? Forgetting that God's anger, his wrath, his hatred of sin are welling up inside of him and he's hardly reserving himself from pouring out his wrath, his judgment on them. And Amos gets to be the carrier of this news. And in chapter 6, woe to the complacent and those who feel secure, how he abhors the pride of the tribe of Jacob. Verse 8. Woe to the complacent and those that feel secure that say, I've got a good enough relationship with God. I don't have anything to be worried about. Actually, God should be thankful to have me on his side. Says, you, that pride is going to get you some trouble. But the section is not to be skipped by us either. In a couple different ways. It's not to say what we have here in our congregation at this time, that's enough. We're the only ones. But also to remind that God is still at work among us. That the only way that we're attractive to the world is in humility, not in pride. And that we are open to God's correction. And that God can make us a better representation of himself. And if the church is not humble... How is the world attracted to it? If we're judgmental and arrogant and put ourselves on the outside or up above, we have very little connection and outreach to the world around us. We have to be concerned about being complacent and concerned about pride. So that section to me just is a big reminder, which is why I said in Bible class, why Luke 11 through 14 is a strong connection here to Amos. But then we get to chapter 7. You'll notice I skipped through the other ones pretty quick because chapter 7 gets to the visions. The visions are a really good way for me and hopefully for you to remember the book of Amos and to connect to what he's saying. So we start with the visions. 
Do you see that one? We go back to locusts. Chapter 7, God shows Amos a swarm of locusts ready for punishment. Amos asks for mercy. Do you see how powerful that is? God pulls Amos aside and hit Amos, see what's coming? Here's a swarm of locusts. Joel already got that warning, right? Joel is in the midst of a locust plague. Amos gets the warning. See what I'm going to do to them? I'm going to get their attention with locusts. And Amos says, wait, they can't survive that. They're too small. If you do that, I don't think they're coming back. And so God relents. The next thing, chapter 7. Do you like that one? If I'm not going to destroy them with locusts, how about I purge them by fire? God shows Amos judgment by fire. Amos asks for mercy and says they can't survive that. And God relents. Says, okay. You know they deserve it. But I'll, no, if they can't handle it, it's okay. But then we get the next one. God shows Amos a plumb line. What's a plumb line used for? Do you hold it up there and it goes straight down. What's it used for, Greg? For making a wall plumb. For making it plumb. Because can a plumb line lie? Is gravity predictable? Yeah, but wind isn't. But wind isn't. <laughs> so in the right environment, this is a way to say you can trust that this is true, that it is honest, that is, whatever is up against this, this is correct, even if it shows you that something else is not correct. So Amos gets this vision, and he says, well, locusts, they can't do it, fire, they can't do it, but Amos, look at this. The object lesson shows how far off true the people are, and what happens. Amos does not Ask for mercy. Amos says, I see that line, and if that's up against the people, we are way off course. What do you do once it's crooked? Now what do we do? It looked okay until you provided it by something pure. How is your life compared to Jesus? Is he not the true plumb line for that too? See, because we can compare our lives to somebody else and say, hey, I'm as good or better than that person. But when you put it up against Jesus, you don't ask. Nobody can say, oh, they don't deserve it. Now you ask for forgiveness. And that's the vision. This has happened a few times. Amaziah the priest sends a message to King Jeroboam saying, Amos is saying things that aren't nice. So the king tells him to stop talking because you're making people feel uncomfortable. So the priest goes to the king and says, he's making things tough here. Because we're trying to tell everybody things are fine. And he comes in and he says, well, we're not fine. And the king says, well, I don't like that. So let's just get him out of here. Amos, you can't talk here anymore. We often get the same request today when we see if people are thirsting for forgiveness. When we, they invite us into their lives and we say, things aren't as well as what you think they are. You need to go to a God of forgiveness. And they say, stop talking. I don't want that message. Don't bring your religion around here. You have your faith, I have my faith. Don't we get the same thing today? We're just looking for people that are thirsting to be in a right relationship with God. But sometimes the king and the priest kick us out. In chapter 7, 14, and 15, we read, 
I was neither a prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Was he raised as a priest? Was he raised as a prophet? Did he know enough of God's word to be sent on a mission? You see where we're going. You feel it coming? Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Who's that passage for? Go and make disciples. Who's that for? Use the Blake finger. It doesn't matter if you were raised as a priest. It doesn't matter if you were raised as a prophet. This is your ministry. You have been called to go. That's the first word. He said to Amos, go. He says to Isaiah, go. He says to you, go. Don't just stay, go. Get up off the couch, find people, make disciples. Who's thirsty for forgiveness? They're not beating down your door. Go. Find them. Chapter 8. Another image. We read of an object lesson using a basket of ripe fruit, telling Amos that the time is ripe for my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. The chapter also gives a glimpse of what the day of judgment will be like. Is it happy chapter? And the day of judgment will be like, everybody will be fantastic. They're going to just be so excited. No, it involves destruction, fear, screaming, death. But yet, there were some in the group that were saying, oh, I can't wait for the day of the Lord to put up with all these sinners. He says, when I start acting... It's not going to be good. And the time is now, the basket of ripe fruit. Amos 8, 11. Thirsty passage. The days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine for hearing the words of the Lord. Is that a cool passage? Day is coming when I will stop talking when my prophets won't go out and people will wonder what is God up to. See, we know that in history is the 400 years of silence between the two testaments before the beginning of John the Baptist in the wilderness. Today, God's word is available to us constantly. Amen? Like, constantly? Constantly. My little phone? Constantly. Is it available to anyone in Western culture, in our community? Constantly. We don't have a famine for the Word of God, do we? How long would it take you to find something spiritual in your house, on your computer, on your phone, in the phone book? seconds. That's available to anybody in our community. The problem isn't that it's a famine for it. God's word is constantly available and people resist it as a source of refreshment. Doesn't that bother you? That it's so available that people say, I don't like it. I don't like that water. I want flavored water. Do you have diet flavored water? No, I have water. This is what I have. This thirsty water. It's pure water. We haven't messed with it. This is what we have. It'll quench your thirds. Do you want it? No, I don't like that. Do you have a Diet Coke? No. Do you have a Pepsi? Absolutely not. <laughs> but that's a bias. We still offer it, don't we? So what can we do that gets people 
to ask for forgiveness. What we can do on our side is I'm ready to share it and I'm going to pray for those that are thirsty. Because do we not believe that there are thirsty people in our community? That are the thirsty people in our lives? That at some stage in the relationship that, that we have, that somebody is going to be thirsty to say, but what does God think? Where is God in all of this? We can't make people be thirsty, and there's no famine for the Word of God, but what we offer is true, pure, quenching, not confusing. But if we stop offering it because everybody else is offering a version of it, we're not helping people either. Chapter 9. Do you want the bad news, the bad news, the bad news, or some good news? Chapter 9 concludes this, but actually ends with some good news. The bad news. Chapter 9, verse 4, I will fix my eyes upon them for evil and not for good. That's a pretty troublesome passage. When God says, when I look at them, I'm going to find ways to mess up their lives. The only way that I'm going to look at them is so that I can cause some problems. I'm going to fix my eyes on them for evil, not for good. That's not a good spot to be in. All who deserve punishment will be punished. That's the point of the first part of chapter 9. So who deserves punishment? All who have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So that includes us as well. But everyone who deserves punishment will be punished. Nobody escapes. Nobody is found innocent. Verses 11 to 15 end the prophecy with the good news. But even the good news is tainted a bit by the bad news because of how far off course that they've come. He says, Israel's restoration by the hand of God himself. Israel will be restored. Here's the good news. The good news is not that I will not send you to exile, which is what they probably wanted to hear. The, ex the good news is after I send you to exile, after you're punished, I'll bring you back and I won't uproot you again. Here's the challenge in Amos. It's before the divided kingdom. Do you know what happens to the ten tribes? Do you remember what happens to the two? Two were bad and, or two were good and ten were bad. Well, it's kind of a... The ten tribes never come back. Ten tribes of Israel, ten twelfths of the nation is gone forever. Only two tribes return. That's why when Jonah goes to preach, it's to the people that destroyed 10 out of 12. And he doesn't want to be there. But he promises him at the end of Amos, I will bring you back from exile. Some choose to not come back. They assimilate, they stay in their own places. The Assyrians return them but it's a very small return. The two tribes don't go into captivity. The ten tribes do. The Babylonians take the lower two. That's later on, but we're jumping ahead in history. But he says, I won't uproot you again. When you come back, I won't uproot you. Today I wanted to read Amos and connect to the account of a person trying to pass on God's message of forgiveness to a people that think life is fine. Does that seem somewhat relevant? Amos wants them to thirst for forgiveness, but their pride is in the way. The people have enough wealth to not need God. They have enough religion to do the right things with the wrong motives. They have enough peace to not be worried about losing everything. But God sends Amos anyways. He sends a shepherd and a fig nipper to speak to the people that he interacts with on his journey. And he has done the same for us. When I read Amos and think of the congregation, it leads me to ask for these blessings from a God that I know 
wants to bless us. So instead of the usual application style that I do, here's the blessings that I would like to pass on to us that I think God would like to pass on to us from Amos. May God bless you with thirsty people in your life. Amen. Don't we need that? Don't we need some people that are at least seeking? May God bless us with that. May you be aware of your sin and be on the alert for pride. I think we need that too. May you avoid the entanglement of wealth and busyness so that you can find those that are thirsty, so you can invest in them, so that you can make it relationships. May you desire forgiveness in the advancement of the kingdom. May you realize the importance of what God has forgiven you and that that empowers you to advance the kingdom. May you thirst and be refreshed by God's word in your own life. May you not give up sharing the good news of God's forgiveness, even when it seems like nobody's listening. Because some people are. May you have a head of flint, which is a good prophet passage, and a soft heart as you face the opposition of a stubborn and prideful world that you just don't quit. But it's compassion that drives you forward. May you take time to praise God for his grace and his mercy. <laughs>